Okay, um, in this short collaborate session, we'll discuss the lab liquids, liquid measures, and solutions. Okay, so I'll give you some definitions and tell you a couple things, and then we'll discuss whether things mix or not, or what the rules are. Okay, so two simple terms you should be aware of is uh, solvent. Okay, solvent is any substance, usually a liquid, which is capable of dissolving one or several substances, thus creating a solution or a mixture. And the universal solvent is water. So you should know that the universal solvent is water. Okay, the solute is whatever substance uh, that's dissolved in the solvent, okay? For example, salt water, sugar water, et cetera. The salt to sugar would be the solute. Okay, later on, we'll talk about the uh, concentration of solutions in class, okay? Now, a couple of definitions, and uh, these definitions really have to do with the properties of the uh, mixture, uh, and a lot has to, has to do with the size of the uh, par particles in the solute, okay? The first thing is a true solution, okay? A true solution is homogeneous. In other words, if you take a tablespoon of <clears throat> the a true solution, you cannot tell it from any other tablespoon of the true solution. Everything looks identically the same. Everything's mixed equally all over. Okay. <clears throat> in, in a true solution, the particle sizes are not visible. You can't see anything. It looks like whatever. Okay. Size is usually uh, less than one nanometer. Okay. And true solutions are also clear. All right. Uh, the, uh, well, they're transparent and clear. So transparent means you doesn't mean they're 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 um, there's no color. You know, it could be a, a, a light yellow color or whatever color, as long as it's transparent. Okay. Uh, true solutions pass through a filter paper. Okay. Well, filter paper. You know, you understand the idea behind filtration. Filtration is exactly why you have a screen on your window. Right, to not let the bugs in. The bugs are too big to get through the uh, meshing of the screen. So if it, if the particles or if the bugs are smaller than the screen size, then they'll get through. So that's the idea behind filtration. <clears throat> okay, if you leave a true solution for you know infinity, then the uh, solute will not settle out. So you won't see any particles settling on the bottom of your solution, okay? And then finally, there's no Tyndall effect. I'll explain Tyndall effect on the next slide, okay? So I'll tell you, so just be aware, true solutions have no Tyndall effect. And on the side here, I've mentioned solid solutions, okay? A solid solution is known as an alloy, okay? And an example, good example of an alloy is brass, okay? Brass is made of copper and zinc. And how do you make a solid solution? Obviously you melt copper, you melt zinc, and then you combine them, okay? And then when it hardens, you have a solid solution. And a solid solution is known as a an alloy, okay? Now, if the particle size gets slightly larger than in a true solution, we call those colloids, okay? Once again, uh, um, there's a Tyndall effect. Uh, well, there is a Tyndall effect. There is no Tyndall effect in this true solution. They're heterogeneous, means the solute uh, particulates are not distributed equally all over the place, right? It's just not, not equal. That's what heterogeneous means, okay? And there is a Tyndall effect. Once again, I'll explain that in a minute. The colloidal particles are small enough that they can pass through filter paper. So you cannot separate the solute out of a colloid using filter paper. Okay. You can, however, separate the particles with a centrifuge. You cannot do that with a true solution. So a centrifuge, you know, spinning it around, the particles will move to the outside. And once again, in a colloid, the particles do not settle. Okay. All right, and then we have suspensions, wherein the uh, particle size is, is, is uh, greater than 100 nanometers. So here in suspensions, some suspensions, you can actually see the uh, solute, right? The particles of the solute. Yes, there is a Tyndall effect, and it can be separated through filter paper because the particle size now is so big that the filter paper can stop those particles. And yes, the particles do settle. So I should put that as four down here, okay? 
particles settle, okay? If you leave a suspension long enough, the particles will settle. And an example of, uh, of, a, of a, uh, a suspension would be if you put sand in a jar with some water and you shook it up, well, you see all those particles moving around. But after a while, if you just leave it, the sand, you know, all settles at the bottom. Okay, so that's that's the suspension. And you can see the particles, obviously, of sand. Okie doke. So let's go on and let me tell you about the Tyndall effect. Okay, so here's the Tyndall effect. Tyndall, T. Y N D A L L effect. And the Tyndall effect, I'll just write it here and then I'll draw a little picture, okay, has to do with the scattering of light. Okay, so scattering of light means the light bounces off particles, scattering of light. If the particles are so small, the light doesn't scatter. So for example, here's a jar, okay? And I'll put water in there. Okay, and there's some water, okay? And this is a true solution, okay? So it's a true solution. So it's a solution with water. It doesn't matter what it is. It's a true solution, okay? So the Tyndall effect is if you take a light, usually a laser, and we'll do this in lab, and there should be a demonstration video. If we take a light, here we'll take a laser, usually red light. What happens is the light goes right through. Nothing happens. And that's why we say there's no Tyndall effect. There's no scattering. No scattering of the light. Of light. The particle size in a true solution are just too small. Well, now if we look at a uh, colloidal suspension, uh, a co colloidal uh, solution uh, mixture or, or a uh, suspension, we have the same type of picture. Okay. So we take our beaker or whatever we have, we put some solute. So again, in here, could be a suspension or a uh, or a, uh, a colloidal mixture, colloid, colloid. Okay. Now, same picture. Now, if we take a laser, now it turns out in a suspension, the particle size are pretty big. Okay, I'm just going to exaggerate them. Okay, the particle size, the solute are pretty big. Okay, so now we're going to take a laser. Woo, this is my laser. I'm going to shoot it through. But now when the laser hits a particle, boom, it bounces off. Boom, boom. So it's like a billiard ball. Boom, boom, boom. You know, and then some something come out. So this is, yes, a Tyndall effect. Yes, the particle uh, uh, scatter the light. Yes, Tyndall effect. Yes, scattering of, of light. And that's what the uh, Tyndall effect is, okay? Very simple. Okie doke. So the Tyndall effect really is telling you the particle size are, 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 are in of the solute are large enough such that the uh, light going through scatters, okay? And there should be a demonstration on the uh, lab videos and we do this demonstration in lab itself. Okie doke. Let's talk about how we mix things. Let's talk about some rules for mixing. Before that, let's re re remember a couple little things, right? We said atoms, just very quick, right? Are electrically neutral. Electrically neutral. What does that mean? It means has no charge, right? Has no charge, no net charge. No net charge, what does that mean? That just means the number of plus charges, protons, equals the number of negative charges, electrons, right? So it's neutral right? It's neutral. Well, the same is true when you take a collection of atoms, right? A collection. Of, so if you collect atoms, collection 
of atoms, right? And when you of atoms, right? And when you put them together, we all know we make molecules. Molecules. Again, you know, H2O, everybody knows H2O, etc. Right? That's a molecule, two hydrogen atoms with one oxygen atom. Okay. And collection of mo atoms, molecules are also neutral, no net charge, also neutral. However, how the charge is distributed is uh, in the molecule uh, is what we're going to discuss. So I want to discuss the distribution of charge, even though the net charge is zero. Distribution of charge. Okay. And I'll, I'll, in particular, I'll talk about water first. Okay. So if we look at a water molecule, and, and again, we haven't discussed chemistry yet, okay? But a water molecule has a hydrogen atom. A hydrogen atom has one electron, one proton. And water has two hydrogen atoms. And this has one electron, one proton, okay? And then there's an oxygen atom. It turns out oxygen needs two electrons to be happy. Again, it really wants to be happy. See, there's a happy oxygen. And it's only happy if it has two more electrons. Well, the hydrogen is very generous and gives an electron to the oxygen. And this hydrogen is very generous and gives an electron to the oxygen. Now the oxygen's happy. You got two uh, extra electrons here. But if you give up an electron, all that's left of the hydrogen is a proton. So this has a plus charge. And this has a plus charge. Okay. Now notice the water molecule itself. This is still neutral, right? This is H2O. And there's no charge. It's neutral. There's no charge. The number of pluses equals the number of minuses. Okay, but the plus and minus is now distributed in a, in, a, in a way wherein this part of the molecule looks like a plus and this part of the molecule, because of the two extra electrons, is minus. So when the charge is separated like that, when the charge is separated, charge is separated sorry, uh, we say that the molecule is polar. So we would say water is a polar molecule. Or we'd say the molecule is polarized. And again, we can use this in a sociologic sense in, in society, polarized. Some people are for, you know, one thing and other people are against that thing. So we have society, people on one side of an issue and people on the other, okay? So a, the perfect example of a polar molecule, if anybody asks you, is water, okay? Water is a polar molecule. And this is gonna be our guide, as you'll see. This is gonna be a guide for us in a little bit, okay? Now, most molecules or many molecules, usually organic, usually organic molecules, organic molecules are a little complicated because organic molecules are usually very large. And so they're mostly nonpolar, usually. Organic. Oh, well, what is an organic molecule? Organic just means it has carbon. Again, we'll see this when we do organic chemistry. Okay, or get usually organic molecules are nonpolar. <clears throat> nonpolar. Once again, organic molecules are neutral. So nonpolar just means if this is whatever organic molecule, the pluses and minuses are all mixed in. You see, there's they're not on one end and they're not at the other end. They're just all interspersed together. Okay, so you can't tell that one side is positive and one side is negative. So this would be a nonpolar molecule. Okay? So you can't tell that one side is positive and one side is negative. So this would be a nonpolar molecule. 
Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'll tell you the gist of what the experiments that we're going to do are about. First, there's a rule for mixing, okay? There's a rule on whether things will mix. Rule for mixing, I'll say. Mixing. Now, the chemists have a very fancy word for mixing. You and I know what mixing is. They call it miscibility, M-I-S, miscibil, miscibility, sorry. Okay. So we want to see if something is miscible. Means if they mix, miscible. That's the adjective. Missibility has to do with the verb. And immissible. I M M I S C I B L E. Immissible. Okay. So in one case, we'll write an M. In the other case, an I, if it's immissible. Okay. And the question is what is the rule? What is the rule for miscibility? What is the rule for miscibility? And it's not an absolute rule, okay? It, it, it's, it's, there's a little gray areas in this. What is the rule for miscibility? Miscibility. Itty, okay. Well, the rule is actually a very straightforward rule, and it's very easy to remember. Okay, the rule is this: like dissolves like. Wow, what a sweet rule! What the heck does it mean? What it means, if you have one polar substance, I'll call it polar substance A, will mix with polar substance B because they're both polar. So if I know that substance A is polar, if I say substance A is polar, I know that. And then I mix in substance B, and I don't know that it's polar yet. If substance B mixes with substance A, then I say, yay, I know that substance B must be polar because it mixed with A. However, if substance B does not mix with substance A, then we can conclude that substance B must be nonpolar, right? Nonpolar. So let's do a very simple example, okay? We already had our perfect example of a polar molecule, right? Don't forget this. Our polar molecule is water. Okay, water. Okay, now suppose I add water with oil. What I get is do not mix. Everybody knows water and oil do not mix. Okay, well, what can we conclude about oil? Well, again, we know. This. Okay, well, what can we conclude? about oil. Well, again, we know that water is polar. How do we know that? Because we just told you it's polar, right? Water is polar. And if oil does not mix with it, then remember, like dissolves like. So therefore, oil, we conclude, is non-polar because it did not mix with water. Okay, so we can conclude that the oil is nonpolar. Okay. 
an example, let me just tell you an example um, over here of nonpolar molecules. Nonpolar molecules. Let me give you a hint so you can identify on our level the simplest nonpolar molecules. Okay, a non remember a polar molecule, remember a polar molecule, I'll do that over here, means on one side of molecule, the pluses like to go, and on the other side of molecule, the negative charges like to go. So one part pulls on the negative charges more than the other charge side, right, and pulls the negative charges, electrons away from the positive, right, this is a polar molecule. In a nonpolar molecule, remember, the charge is evenly distributed. So nothing pulls on the charge more on one side than on the other side. Well, an example of a polar molecule would be iodine. Okay. An iodine molecule is written like this, I2. What is I2? Well, it's an iodine atom connected to another iodine atom, okay? That's not a minus sign, okay? They're connected, okay? Now, does this iodine atom pull on electrons more than this guy? And the answer is no. The charge is evenly distributed. Charge is evenly distributed between the two atoms, evenly distributed. So this is our hint, okay, I'll say this is our, our hint. So here's a hint, Shh, don't tell anybody, okay? This is our hint if we want to identify simple nonpolar molecule, nonpolar molecule. So a nonpolar molecule would be I2, well, it would be O2. It would be Cl2, it would be F2, it would be N2. Everybody see this? Whenever you have two of the same element, two, 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 that means the charge is evenly distributed, okay? So that's a hint that we have a nonpolar molecule. Okay. Now in the lab, we're going to look at a couple of different substances, and we'll learn what these are later. Okay, we'll, we'll we'll learn the formulas for these things. But one of the things is called toluene. This is an organic compound. Okay, again, we will learn that this is really methyl benzene. We're going to learn this very soon. Methyl benzene. You don't need to know this right now. Okay. And we'll see, we're going to draw it in a certain way. Again, you do not need to know this right now. And this is going to be methyl benzene or toluene, but you don't need to know this. You don't need to know this right now. As I said, we're going to get to this, okay? But I will tell you that toluene is pretty much a nonpolar molecule. Non -polar. Remember, I said most organic things nonpolar molecule. Okay. And we could figure out then if we try to mix it with water, what would happen? Okay. Uh, another thing we'll be using is ethyl alcohol. Ethyl alcohol. Okay. Also called ethanol. Once again, we'll learn this soon enough, ethanol, also called ethanol. Once again, we'll learn this soon enough, ethanol. And uh, C2H5OH, I think would be the formula. Okay, once again, we're going to learn this, we're going to learn this. An ethyl alcohol is a polar molecule. I'll put slightly polar. Remember, I said things are not so black and white, slightly 
polar molecule. Okay. And then finally, <clears throat> uh, finally, we'll, we'll talk about chloroform. And I, I think if you watch enough movies, you know, chloroform, you know, they put it on a handkerchief and then the uh, person passes out in like three seconds. Well, you will pass out with chloroform. It was used as this an, an, anesthesia, sorry. Uh, um, and I think it's uh, banned now. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for use, but really it would take you like five to 10 minutes to breathing that stuff in to pass out. So, you know, the, the movies are really great that they show that. Um, and chloroform, well, carbon makes four bonds. So chloroform is a C, H, and is three chlorines. Again, you don't need to know this stuff at all. Okay. But I will tell you that chloroform is a polar molecule. And so in lab, we're going to mix toluene and ethyl alcohol and chloroform and water. We're going to mix all these combinations. We're going to mix all these combinations and see if they mix and see if our rule that like dissolves like is really true. Okay. Like dissolves like. Okay, so I'm telling you that these things, what these things are, okay? But we want to try to deduce this in the lab. And we deduce it knowing what water is. Remember, water is polar. So we can see if things mix with water, and that'll determine whether that substance is polar or nonpolar. And then we can mix each of them. So if we mix ethyl alcohol with water, and we mix... Uh, toluene with water, then we can take a guess, an educated guess on whether toluene and ethyl alcohol will mix, okay? Or if they're miscible. So we're going to check the uh, miscibility of all these substances, okay? So, we're, so the lab, the idea then is to uh, determine the miscibility, determine the miscibility of these compounds, of these compounds, these, I'll, I'll put substances with each other, substances. With each other. Okay, so that that's the uh, that's the idea. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna check that. Okie doke. So, uh, what else? What else? Oh, okay. So the other thing, the last thing we do in this lab is we we look at dialysis. Okay, and everybody knows about dialysis. I think in a hospital, dialysis, it's a filtration process, dialysis. It's a filtration process. Right? They clean out your 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 kidneys filtration process. So we're gonna have a dialysis bag. And we're going to put it in water. I'll draw a picture. Okay, and this is going to be um, 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 uh, pure water, you, you know, uh, absolutely no, no chemicals in it. Uh, distilled water is what I'm trying to say, distilled water. We're going to put distilled water. Distilled water, okay. So we're going to have a beaker like this. And we're going to have this dialysis bag. It looks 
it looks something really like that. It's just a, it's just a plastic bag and we've got a string. Okay, so we're, we're hanging this thing out. This is just a string. Okay, and, and uh, so let me label. So we're, we're hanging this thing out. This is just a string. Okay, and, and uh, so let me label. Okay, so this is our dialysis bag. Dialysis bag. Okay. And I'll put this little blue, 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 like this. Okay. So now we know that this is our uh, distilled water. That means there's no impurities. Distilled water. Okay, and then we're going to put three things, three things inside of, of, of our, um, of our uh, dialysis bed, okay? And inside the dialysis bag, we're going to have, so let me write that, inside dialysis bag. inside dialysis bag okay we're going to put three compounds okay um now now the dialysis bag is permeable things can can pass through all right so inside the dialysis bag we're going to put some starch Starch has very large molecules, starch. And we're going to put some barium chloride. Okay. And what we're going to do to this thing is we're going to heat it up. We're going to add heat. Now, if we take barium chloride, it doesn't matter the formula, it's BaCl2. If we add heat, what we're going to do is we're going to break this up into barium ions and chlorine ions. Okay, we're going to break up these ions. So these are ions because they have charges. And our question is, will the barium ions, the chlorine ions, and the starch pass through the filter paper. Uh, pass through the dialysis bag, I'm sorry. Pass through dialysis membrane. Dialysis, I'll put membrane, how's that? Dialysis membrane. Well, if they're small enough, they'll pass through. If they're too big, they won't pass through, okay? And I'll tell you how we test it in a second. Okay, so the first thing before we do anything is we check the distilled water. We check the distilled water. So we take three beakers and we're gonna check to see if that water, before we do anything, we're gonna check if that water has any barium ions, any chlorine ions or any starch ions. And we wanna make sure that nothing happens. Then we're gonna heat the water and then we're going to see if these things will come out, if these things come out of the dialysis bag into the water. Because then we're gonna sample this water afterwards. We're gonna check the distilled water and test it to see if there's barium ions, to see if there's chlorine ions, and to see if there's starch, okay? Well, the test for chlori chloride ions is silver nitrate. So I'm gonna put it here test for Cl minus ions is silver nitrate. Nitrate, that's silver, Ag, and nitrate is NO3. 
Okay, so the test for chlorine atoms is going to be silver nitrate. Okay. The test for barium ions. Mm -hmm. Test for barium ions. Test for Ba plus two ions is sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid. H two SO four, and that's aqueous. It's in solution. So silver, we're going to put. Uh, well, I'll tell, tell us in a second. Okay. Uh, the third thing that we're going to test for is is starch. Okay. So the test for starch, right? We we want to test for all three things is iodine solution. So test for starch. Test for starch. Test for starch is going to be an iodine solution. Okay. Now, if um, for the barium ions, when we put the uh, sulfuric acid in, if a white precipitate of barium sulfate, uh, white precipitate uh, settles on the bottom, we know that there were barium ions. Okay, so if there's barium ions, we're going to get BASO4. This will be a white pre precipitate will settle on the bottom. That's the test. So if barium's in that water and we put sulfuric acid in it, then we'll get a white precipitate when we put uh, uh, sulfuric acid in, okay? For the chloride ions, if we add the silver nitrate, once again, we get uh, a white precipitate. So things will settle down on the bottom. And for the starch, if we put some iodine solutions, we get a very dark blue or blue black color will mean that there's starch in the water. Okay. So before we boil this stuff, before we add heat to this system, we're going to check this water. We're going to check the distilled water. We're going to take three test tubes, three test tubes, take some of that water, put it in three test tubes. In one, we're going to put barium, uh, uh, sorry, silver nitrate, and we'll see nothing happens because it's distilled water. In the second one, we're going to put sulfuric acid, put sulfuric acid in there. Again, nothing happens because it's distilled water. In the third one, we're going to put iodine solution. And again, nothing happens. So this is before. If that water, distilled water is pure, then nothing should happen. No color change, no precipitates. After we boil, after we heat this for a while, then we're going to check this water again. We're going to check this water distilled water. Once again, we're going to take three different test tubes, right? And we're going to fill them up with the water. We're going to take three more test tubes and fill them up. And once again, we're going to check for barium ions. We're going to check for uh, uh, chlorine ions, and we're going to check for starch. If there's a white precipitate, when we put the silver nitrate in, we know there's chlorine atoms. If there's a white precipitate, when we put sulfuric acid in that water, then we know that there's barium ions. And if it turns blue, black, or very dark color, when we put iodine solution, then we know that the starch got through the dialysis bag. Okay, so that's the whole idea. We check the water before, make sure that, that this distilled water, that there are no starch or chlorine ions or barium ions. Then we heat this water with the with the dialysis bag in there and we see if the chlorine ions the barium ions and or the starch pass through the dialysis bag into the distilled water and then we check check the uh, distilled water with the uh, silver nitrate the sul sul sulfuric acid and the iodine solution to see whether uh these these substances did indeed pass through the dialysis bag okay and that's the whole purpose of the lab 
and I hope you watch the videos and uh, enjoy yourself. That's it.